Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. I'm glad and honored to be here. And now the topic is indeed economics. I took the liberty to change the channel title economy to economics because I am an economist that took the liberty to think about economic theory and practice of construction and uh, of sustainability. So as opposed to the previous presentation will be quite a change of program. And one might also quote Monty Python saying, uh, let's go now for something completely different. Because now it's about cost, it's about prices, about demand, markets. But in the end, if you think about it, well, it's not too different because the general goal, of course, is, is the same. Uh, creativity has to go hand in hand with uh, economics, has to go hand in hand with the markets, with the governments, as we have seen it, in order to be successful in the end. So what is the economic contribution in this respect? You know, in the 18th century, there was uh, the prediction of Thomas Malthus about the stagnant population. He said, well, there might be a good harvest, population might increase for a while, but there's no way that population can grow in the long run. And then in the 19th century, uh, as a consequence of that, people thought, well, economics is just a dismal science. It's just dull, dark. There's a bunch of doomsdayers thinking about stagnancy, about steady state, which cannot be overcome. But now today we talk about innovation, we talk about sustainable investments, we talk about social responsibilities. So it's much brighter, it's much more optimistic. We have overcome the Malthusian trap. We have reached constant growth rates over decades. And this is due to innovation, all these things which are here. So question now arises, are we now too optimistic? Are we now too optimistic in our predictions? What is the accuracy of our predictions? Are they precise, yes or no? And now people are concerned that our predictions that we do in economics are not really precise. So let me tell this uh, short story here about the Nobel Prize. Here it says economics is not a science, it says it's a field. Economics is the only field in which two people can get a Nobel Prize for saying exactly the opposite thing. And guess what, it's even worse than that, because they got the Nobel Prize in the same year, they had to share. So Myrdal and, and, and Hayek, which are really were opposing, well, they had to share the Nobel Prize. So we can say it happened only once, it's an outlier. But what about sustainability? Here's a quote of Kenneth Boulding, um, kind of an economist. Uh, well, he called himself an economist. He, he, he knew some of economics. He said, anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever on a finer planet is either a madman or an economist. And please note, I have put this, uh, well, in bold. I don't know whether you can see it, but still, uh, the madman is, is, is really close to the economist, right? So, well. And then, of course, one of our colleagues doing endogenous growth here, Paul Romer, said there's absolutely no reason why we cannot have persistent growth as far into the future as you can imagine. Well, these are two concepts of uh, growth. One is based on material, on uh, supplies, which are limited on a finite planet. The resources are limited, we all know it. But we can growth, have, can, can have growth on a different basis, on knowledge capital, on human capital, on physical capital, which is not uh, in that uh, same way uh, limited in the end. So it's a different growth concept and sustainability is a lot about switching from the old to the new growth regime in the end. So if this is all a bit controversial about uh, economics and, and how we, uh, it's perceived in the public, we have to add, of course, two buts. But number one is markets and also the governments are the reality. We have to deal with them. We have to understand them as well as possible. So we have really to deal with them and we have to do uh, science uh, in economics to, to, to really to capture what's going on in markets. Markets are chaos. It's a, not only the cities are chaotic, markets are very chaotic. It's lots of errors, trial and error, but there's also lots of innovation and of course there is a, uh, there's a checks and balances on markets and in the end the good, uh, in, in, in the good sense the, the good ideas should prevail. But number two is the cons consensus among economists is actually is large. But when we have a consensus, we are not in newspaper, so that's, that's not interesting. If there's no consensus, we are in newspaper, and when we are divided, it's mostly also for political reasons or for economic interest. 
because of course with our uh, results, with our predictions, we are touching upon individual interest. Sustainability is another issue. What about the economic sustainability? It's, it's, it's a wide uh, field, of course. One of uh, the colleagues in resource economics said sustainability is even a metaphor for some of the most perplexing consequential issues facing humanity that might even include the very survival of our species. Now, I think, well, if, if you put that much uh, emphasis on, on this issue that many economists work in the field and actually deal with these issues, it's not true. Many, most economists do not deal with this important issue, so it's really, we should, uh, we should strengthen our efforts in this respect. There has been the term of strong sustainability. This more com comes more from the ecological side, that uh, would mean that we should preserve the stock of natural capital. This is too strong of a requirement in our view. Economists strive more for weak sustainability, would say, we have to maintain an aggregate productive capacity. We have to maintain the chances for future generations. There is a possibility to trade. We can substitute. We can have a higher uh, physical and knowledge capital and uh, drive down some part of the natural capital. This is feasible, but we have to really make it abundantly clear that the chances for future generations are the same as we enjoy them today. So there is sustainability with substitution possibilities, but we should not drive the natural capital uh, too low because we know that there are some ecological thresholds. For example, for, for global warming, we should not go uh, too high uh, warming because this would uh, cause an immense damage to the, to the surface of the world. So we should have, uh, when going uh, down with the natural capital, we should observe certain limits. So only then we can uh, achieve what we call a non-declining welfare or utility for the individuals over time. And this is, of course, undiscounted. It should be the same for all the generations. Now, when I talk about sustainability in economic terms, I will have a microeconomic part, I will have a macroeconomic part, and in the end, I will come up with a policy perspective. Microeconomic part is more about the building sector. I will talk about certain aspects of, of the building sector as a whole. Uh, what, is, uh, what, what are the chances? What is the potential? What are the, what, what are the limits? And then I would like to argue, and maybe I have to convince you, maybe I have not to convince you because you know already, that all these things also very much depend on macroeconomic conditions and also depend on, on policy, policy which, which, are, uh, which come with the uh, individual decisions. Because in the end, whether our solutions, whether our projects are sustainable, yes or not, is depending on what the macroeconomic conditions are and is also depending on whether, in general, we have a climate policies, we have energy policies which are going in the direction of sustainability. If not, then we might be alone, we might be too early and the projects uh, could uh, not pay off in the end. So let me start with the microeconomic part of the topic. The building sector, as you might know, is a, a big uh, energy consumer, accounts for about 40% of primary energy consumption in almost every country. It's also the largest contrib single contributor to global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It is, of course, a big sector. It's 10% of uh, global GDP, employing more than 100 million people. And it offers, because it is so energy intensive and is so carbon intensive, it has, of course, a potential for energy saving and for carbon saving, uh, which, is, which is clearly there. And also it can contribute to a healthier, more productive environment. And the International Energy Agency, IEA, uh, puts a lot of uh, effort in, in, in pointing this out, that the building sector is really one of the most cost-effective sector for reducing energy consumption and carbon emissions. Now, there are, of course, economic, direct economic benefits uh, of sustainable buildings, or uh, if, you, if you think about the longer run, uh, what you can get as, as uh, direct earnings. Well-designed, constructed, operated, maintained green buildings can have many benefits, durability, reduced costs for energy, water, operation and maintenance, improved health, productivity, and potential for uh, greater occupant satisfaction. These are all possibilities. There's a potential, but of course, uh, as we see, and we already heard it this morning, it's, it's no, no guarantee, uh, but we have, of course, when, when there is a potential, we have to think clearly about how we can, uh, uh, well, we can get the gains and how we can uh, reap the, the uh, profits that are possible here. 
When you think about cost savings or at least a, a good cost management, if you already include the ideas in, in the design phase, then of course you have a, a higher potential to, to really uh, be cost effective in the end. And if you have an integrated team of uh, building professionals, also this increases the chances uh, uh, that you have a not too high cost uh, to build sustainable buildings. So this is an integrated uh, approach to systems. Rather than to have a, a collection of, of disconnected systems, one should see it as a whole system, work together with a team of specialists, and this would be then the best chance to be successful in, in uh, sustain, building sustainable buildings. And then, if successful in the end, uh, the good buildings will not cost more than other buildings, or only a little bit more, and maybe even in the long run, uh, they will be uh, not, not more expensive than others. Of course, here it is about individual decisions. It depends on individual discount rates about how you uh, measure uh, future gains against uh, uh, present profits. All these things matter, and all these things have an impact on your individual decisions. Now talking of uh, CO2 uh, savings potential, you can see here this is a, a graph from the International Energy Agency again. Uh, it's also actually a very conservative one because they talk about their own recommendations. I will come back to this in, in, a, in a second, what their recommendations really are. So they think that, of course, when you uh, think what, what would be an undamped uh, carbon emission path, and then we, when we really want to reduce this uh, carbon emissions, uh, what the, uh, the contribution of buildings would be, it would be about 25% here. In fact, if we want to really have a, a stringent climate policy, we should already earlier than that, we should have a peaking of, of, of CO2 emissions, come back to this later, and then, of course, we would have even higher savings than what is, uh, what is given here. On the other hand, when you look at the IPCC reports, at the uh, mitigation potential, again in the year 2030 as it was before, then also here we see that buildings uh, are expected to contribute very highly, that they have a large share in, in possible contribution here. So as a, opposed to energy supply, transport, uh, industry, and so on, you see that the buildings uh, have really uh, a very high uh, potential according to the IPCC. And even more uh, important here, according to the fourth assessment report, is that most of, I will say, one third of, of this uh, emission reduction of the abatement can be uh, achieved at a low cost, say. I'm always cautious to say zero cost because there's always a rationale why, why it's not done. Information costs are not probably not uh, incentive problems. Come back to this. So, if you say zero cost, it's it's almost a bit uh, it's a bit uh, well, it's a bit fishy. Uh, if you also see about this McKinsey reports where people say it's even uh, beneficial to do things, but people do not do this, uh, you would would claim that people are stupid. Economists will not say people are stupid, but maybe if you say it's zero cost, you maybe uh, might forget some of, of the costs which are which are also there. But what is more important here, what is said in the IPCC report, is that the cost per ton of CO2 are low, less than 20 tons. So for 90% for of all these reductions, the costs are relatively low compared to other measures. But still, there is a cost, and of course it depends on macroeconomic conditions whether you want to go in this direction uh, or not. What are the drivers? If you think about the growing need of sustainable buildings, we have a uh, change in demographics, urbanization, as we heard it this morning. We have, uh, uh, well, other things like uh, uh, things which happen in, in, in the world population growth. And then we have economic changes, we change in lifestyle, uh, technology, spread of new equipment, uh, of course, and then the big issues like uh, climate change, changing energy prices and energy systems, and also associated policies. Now, all these things have an impact on return on property in the long run, but of course, it is not uh, easy to uh, get good predictions about these things here. What is doing climate change? What is our climate policy? What, are, what is the future really? Uh, what, what is it uh, doing to your own investment, to your own uh, optimization? We say if, if you break down the sustainability term on this uh, buildings uh, issue, then you can say, well, if you can decrease the risk of a property to depreciate or you can increase the chance of a property to appreciate due to these long-term trends, then you might be on a sustainable path. Now, if it doesn't happen automatically or if it happens too slow, uh, there are good reasons to it. And as I said, in economics, you always think about individual optimization. There are some costs which you, uh, which you might face if you want to uh, uh, go in, in the sustainable direction. Very often, it's, it's an incentive issue. 
that, uh, well, people have different incentives to do things and those who are really, uh, well, consume a lot of energy have no incentives to do it uh, differently. Then information is a big problem, as I said. Information costs are not zero. Uh, we have surveys. We know that people uh, are sometimes really not informed about uh, possible solutions. Also, the uh, availability of uh, technicians might be an issue. And this is also a thing that some people dislike to have higher initial investment and lower operation cost afterwards. So it also here depends on the incentives and also on your discount rate. How much do you value future benefits uh, as opposed to uh, uh, present cost? If you have uh, very impatient investors, then this might be an obstacle for uh, getting green investments. Then, of course, the market risks, uh, and this has also a lot to do with macroeconomic conditions. What about the demand for energy efficiency uh, to grow? What is the, uh, the, the, the frame, the general macroeconomic frame, which, which guides your demand? And then also operational risk. Uh, what about the personnel? What, what do you have uh, to, to run uh, the, uh, the buildings when they are here? And then also, which might be interesting because you have always these civil cases, we have brilliant cases, but well, there's, there's not, not, maybe not enough feedback uh, in, in the terms uh, in, in the field of green buildings. Very quickly, what are the policies which are recommended by the International Energy Agency in this field? They want to have energy codes implemented, they want to have a minimum energy performance, so this could be an, an issue. Uh, they want, uh, well, measures aiming at ne uh, net zero energy consumption in buildings in the long run, but I mean, uh, this is just the aim and then you have to think about how you want to implement it. You can, of course, aim at improving energy efficiency of existing buildings and you can think about labels or certificates. All this will help, but it's not really, uh, maybe it helps a little, but it's maybe not strong enough. Uh, as I said, we have to have uh, it complemented by policies and by macroeconomic conditions. And, of course, this is also uh, for, for building components and for systems. So this will be, of course, uh, the policies which are successful. But again, I think it, if it's voluntary, it, it will go. It will be successful, but maybe it's too slow uh, in terms of the big challenges that we have in terms of climate uh, change and in terms of our energy supply scarcities. Last picture here is about, well, how uh, do the markets look like? Where can we invest? Which direction should we go? In terms of geographic uh, spread, you can see there's a difference between uh, uh, the investment opportunities and the retrofit investment opportunities. So uh, clearly on the left-hand side, more developing countries where you build now a lot of new buildings. And you can see, of course, the big chunks here of uh, China and, 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 uh, and, and others. And here, of course, when you come to retrofit, then you see here uh, US, UK, uh, Canada, France, Sweden, Australia, all these uh, countries which become very interesting for investors uh, if, if really uh, in the long run, this green, uh, develop, uh, this green uh, investment, sustainable construction investment will, uh, will be further promoted. So there is, of course, the market and we can think about now to standardize these uh, the investments more. What about what, what, what about the guideline giving to investors uh, for uh, doing uh, these things? One can think about creating a label. And now I'm, or a rating, and I'm reporting now a very quickly uh, result from a center of the University of Zurich, where they have created a sustainability rating. There is about individual property, also property valuation, or a whole portfolio of, of a firm. And where they, well, can, with the appropriated index and the weighting of the different sub uh, numbers, they find out uh, what, what the uh, sustainability rating is of such a portfolio or, or of a, an investment. And importantly, it's about a life cycle. It starts already with a location decision because also that is, of course, largely interdependent. We are not, uh, we are not islands. It depends on what, what, what is the context of the whole thing. And then it goes on uh, with the operation, renovation decisions. And in the end, uh, also, of course, end of life, demolition and replacement. Now to, um, f well, to, to end this microeconomic part of, of, of my talk, I want to report a little bit about a survey which has been done uh, by the same institute uh, in, in 270 firms in, in Switzerland about the importance for investors, uh, what they think is important in terms of sustainability and what sustainability is uh, as against other targets in investing. So here you can see that for most of the investors, uh, sustainability is an issue. Uh, they think about it. Some of them uh, do not think about it, but this number shrinks. Uh, many of them think most often, and, and some of them think uh, always about sustainability criteria when they think about investing in property. 
Sustainability is third ranked here in terms of targets. Of course, it's, it's, um, the price is also there, but as we have seen, the price might not necessarily contradict sustainability. It depends on, on the design of, of your investment. And then, of course, you see all the other things which are, uh, according to this survey, less uh, important to the investors in, in this survey. There has been three waves, three years or now of this survey been done and we see a little increase, uh, but still, of course, uh, we have a difference between rent and purchase. Overall, a slight increase in the importance of sustainability for investment decisions, but I mean, it's maybe uh, too short run to be uh, conclusive here. And the last slide from this survey is about what, uh, if, if you have a certificate available, would you then be more willing, uh, would you think about sustainability, if you, would you even be willing to pay more for such property, and this is indeed the case, it's a higher share of people who say, well, uh, I would be willing to pay for such a thing if a certificate was available. Now, I want to leave this macroeconomic part and, and go now really to the macroeconomic condition, not only because I'm trained as a macroeconomist, but I think it's really complementary. We have to complement these things with the macroeconomic policies and we have to think about uh, some uh, context which is important for that. So if we care as investors, if we care as, as uh, well, as, as, uh, well in, in the whole building sector about the energy uh, and energy saving, should we also care as a society, as an economy as a whole? Of course we should care. And let me start by showing you these numbers here about the cost of net imports of crude oil. So this is the last numbers which I have uh, in the international comparison. You can see how much different countries and regions spent on uh, oil imports. And you can see, well, the United States has a bit changed in, in, in the recent years, but you see Europe spends almost the same. China spends almost 3% of GDP. Japan spends almost 3% of GDP. India spends more than 7% of GDP for oil imports. And Germany, again, uh, about 2% of GDP for oil imports. Now, what does this say? Well, on the one hand, if you redirect part of this money to domestic investment, you can do many good things. I mean, it's always uh, renewables is, 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 is very, co it's very costly and, and uh, cost of energy efficiency is, well, it costs a lot, but think about these sums of money which you could redirect and create investment and employment uh, domestically. On the other hand, as an economist, I have to stress that these are individual optimizations. These are decisions on markets. It's not for nothing that people decide to uh, in import energy rather than do something else uh, in their own countries. And there I've come to a, a basic topic in, in the whole economic valuation of the thing that in the short run, it might be beneficial to have to use cheap energy and to just to, to burn fossil fuels and to, to, to use it for your operation. In the long run, it might go the other way around. It might be that in the long run, when you do energy efficiency investment, that you learn more, that you have a higher growth rate. So for me, it's crucial to distinguish between the short run what we call the level effects of energy, and the long run, what we call the growth effects of energy. I guess in the general perception, is, is, perception is, is really that both are parallel, that energy is good for income, but energy is also good for growth. And I firmly believe and have, I can document it, it's, it's, that's rather the other way around. In the short run, when you have higher energy prices, when you have to, to decrease your energy input, it, it is of course costly. It harms you. You have to change something. You have to do something. In the long run, if you have different energy regimes, then you might have a better uh, and a higher growth rate. And let me show you these slides here, these comparisons. It's about growth periods. I have uh, then another slide with another three. So I've, I've done five year averages. And what I have on the horizontal axis is the energy use per capita, the vertical axis, the per capita growth rate. These are 37 rich countries, basically the OECD countries, plus some others which are important. So are the richest countries. And what you see, the impact of energy use per capita on growth is negative. So this is quite surprising. And you see it in, in, in three out of four cases, even if, if you know these T-values, if, if you know about statistics, it's even significant. So there is a negative relationship between energy use per capita and the growth rate per capita in these countries. And this is quite surprising because it's not so well known. We, we all tend to think when you look at time series that energy use and income go more or less parallel. But if you do a cross section of countries, it's, it's different. It looks different. And this means that, well, if you, if you choose to lose less, less energy in the long run, you will have a profit. 
Now look at the next series uh, here. I have something which is quite neutral because it's, it's not significant. So this is basically zero, but then goes again to be uh, negative. And this is actually interesting. The last growth period, which I have in international data, shows a very close, uh, well, it's actually quite close. This is an outline, it's China, but, but still I see that there's a, a significant negative relationship between energy use and energy growth. And this shows that, of course, we are, uh, well, we, 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 we are reluctant to, to, to do strict climate policies, to do strict energy policies, but this is mainly for short-run reasons. In the long run, these things might look different. And what is the reason, what are the main reasons that in the long run these things are different? It is, of course, that we can, as we had it before, we can substitute. We can use different inputs compared to energy. Mainly we can do uh, capital accumulation and mainly we can do more in terms of innovation. And this is actually where I see a major development in recent years. If you look at research development demonstration, this is for renewable energy uh, sources. I will have another one in energy efficiency. You can see a remarkable increase. So this is for the European area. This for the United States, which had a remarkable peak at 2009. And then also for other countries like Japan. This has come as a consequence of the increasing oil prices between 2003 and 2008. You remember, the oil prices were uh, exploding. So after that, people thought, OK, we do more in, in terms of innovation to, to, to find substitutes. And in the long run, if engineers think about solutions, they will find something. So there is a, a remarkable increase. Not, it's, it's the absolute number which is impressive, but also the increase which, uh, of money which is now spent in this uh, terms of research and development. Also, as said, also in energy efficiency, again, the peak for the states, but there also for uh, Europe and for other countries, you see that more and more uh, kind of money is spent in this direction. Now, finally, what is this uh, in terms of, of policy and what is the impact? If, if we now think about taking care as a society or the economy as a whole uh, for, for this energy and, and the climate issues. I have an example here which shows what is the impact of a climate policy. And I have uh, done this uh, at the example of Switzerland. Uh, we have a model uh, which we can uh, run uh, to simulate those policies. So the assumption is that we want to fulfill what has been the Copenhagen Accord, the two degrees Celsius target for the world uh, average global warming. This would mean for rich countries, a reduction in CO2 emissions uh, by 2020, 20 to 30% reduction, and by 2050, uh, say 60 to 80% of reduction against the values of 1990. So here, if I take 30% and 80%, it's really, it's very stringent. It's a very tough policy. And the idea is now to see what is now the level effect doing, what, what is, um, if I have really to, to have a strict carbon policy in a country, what is the level effect doing as opposed to the innovation effect induced capital accumulation effect. So these two things are still there. They're opposing and now we want to see how this levels out. The instrument used in the model is a carbon tax, but we can also have a different instruments. And as I said, this is a model we, uh, we developed over a, a, a number of years. And the main strength of the model, which is not often seen in literature, is really about these this long-term issues uh, are, are captured, which are normally uh, not there. So what is the result? Just as an illustration, if you uh, look at consumption, which is a standard, well, this is, is an, uh, represent, representing your welfare or utility level, we compare a business as usual path and a path with the carbon tax, with a, with a string, stringent climate policy, now, we, the first thing we see, this is business as usual without any common policy. We have assumed, well, we start with a normalized value of one in 2010 and go up to 2050. What we see here already when having a moderate growth rate per annum, which is 1.33%, which is very modest, is lower than the OECD predicts for Switzerland. And it's much lower than we had in the past, but we want to be very cautious here. The first thing you, you notice uh, that over these 40 years already here, you have an increase of over 60 or 70% of total income. So if you incur a cost here for doing something which might be useful in terms of climate policy, it's not that you have to pay it out of pocket in the beginning, you can pay it out of your growth dividends. You can take off out of your gains that you have from the growth rate. Now what's the development with the ta carbon tax, which is really a stringent policy. You can see we delay development we will reach the level of 2050 within a three uh, years delay. So we have, uh, well, stretched out development a bit, but of course we have then really almost achieved the carbon-free economy as, 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 a, as, as a benefit. 
So it is still that in the, in the short run, people have to adjust, they have to incur costs, they have to do something, but in the long run, by induced innovation, by capital accumulation, we can moderate the gap, so the gap is not too big in the end. And also, next slide is interesting, if you look at the sectors. Now here again, I have uh, the business usual path a bit flatter, I have to adjust the scale because I have now some sectors which really gain out of this policy, is also something which is not often recognized. One tends to think that the whole economy has to suffer from policy. It's not true. We have sectoral change, and of course, as you know, also the building sector will be one of the sectors, uh, well, which has a net gain out of such policies. So what we have in this case is the machinery sector, which is a, is a real large gainer out of this uh, policy. Uh, chemicals are a gain, and all these other sectors. And it goes down to the uh, uh, to these sectors, which are relatively energy intensive. So, uh, well, agriculture is, of course, not one of the most dynamic sectors. And also the energy intensive sectors, they are, of course, uh, relatively uh, seen, they are losers, but still they have the ab ability to grow and they still have uh, development uh, possibilities. So this shows that we have a sectoral change when you do these policies, but on aggregate, we don't have uh, costs which are too high. And again, the mechanism which drives the whole thing is induced innovation, is induced investment. Now, to conclude, I want to come to policy issues. Why do these things here? Why should these things happen? Why should we uh, do this, uh, this, these policies in this, uh, in this way? As you all know, we are waiting for international climate agreement. But of course, it's, it will not come by itself. We have to negotiate. So finally, I want to talk about climate agreement. I want to talk about the different thing, which are equity principles. Maybe a bit uh, also change of program, but I think it's important. So the climate agreement, as you might know, we should have, by 2015, we should have agreed on a climate agreement. So this is two and a half years to go. And the problem in the, in the past, and I know this from our own experience, was that we had too many things we were talking about, very detailed technical discussions about many, many different issues. And now, recently, there has been the so-called Indian proposal or a country a group which has come in that we should straighten our negotiation issues and talk more about things everybody more or less understand what they mean and these are these equity principles so we should employ the same principles as we have with national legislation on the international level applied to climate policies now this does in my view does not mean that we have to do what what then the meaning was that we have an equal uh, share of uh, an equal access to the carbon space, which means that who has not polluted in the past is allowed to pollute in the future. This is not at all what I mean, but I think we should combine the, the, the most uh, prominent principles to find an international climate agreement. One of them is the so-called ab ability to pay principle. It's very clear, everybody will understand, we call also in, in game theory, we talk, talk about focal points, things that the negotiators, the countries, the population, the governments will understand who is able to do more, will do more. So those who have the possibility to do more in terms of climate policy, they also should contribute more. Just like as we have it with income taxation and also when it comes to contribution to international organization, rich countries pay more and higher contribution. This is maybe the best accepted. This is uh, overall accepted. The second is also very important, but less uh, in, in terms of climate agreements, is the desert principle. If you think about wages, about income, who deserves a higher wage, who deserves a higher income, those who make a higher effort, those who are more uh, capable. So these things should also go in here. If you think about the grants or awards which are given here, who, who is, uh, well, who is getting the award? Those who, who do a good job, who have the best project. So those who do the best climate policies, those who are the forerunners, the pioneers, they should get some reward. Third principle is about burden sharing. Uh, it is clear that every policy causes some cost. And we should think about the proportional burden sharing because these costs for some countries are enormous, especially those who are polluting a lot at the moment. They will have to decrease a lot. So we have to think about their abatement cost and also about political acceptance. This also has to be an issue. And finally, I think it's very important to think about general technology development. This is where I object against this uh, equal access to carbon space, what we see is a delinking, a slow but slowly moving delinking from emissions from, from the general income development. So that means that the emissions 
which have, be well, which were kind of crucial to have development in the past, will become less and less essential for growth. So what we have is a delinking, a decoupling of income development from carbon emissions, and this should also be taken into account. Now, just to, to close uh, the, uh, the, the, the policy section here, I've calculated, based on these principles, on, this, on, a, on a simple combination of these principles, I've calcula calculated carbon budgets uh, up to 2050, which is the deal which we should take within three years. So these are the carbon budgets for 20, uh, well, this is the last numbers I have, up to 2050, when, of course, uh, we should be more or less in, in a steady state. And what you can see here, uh, this is a selection of countries, and you can see this is a country group, and you can see here India and China and the end. I have for every uh, country or country group, I have four different numbers, because it matters, first of all, it matters when do we start counting? When does historic responsibility start? And there have been ideas we should start in 1850 and all of this. I think it's not really uh, sensible. We should probably start in 1990 when international climate agreements and, and really the, the problem was uh, obvious. And then we have two phases from 1990 to 2008 and then from 2008 to 2050. So the question is how much do we wait and how much do we count what has been in the past up to, 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 to the current level? And these are the thetas here. This would mean the light blue would say we, we don't count it, or theta zero would say we, we don't count this historic responsibility. This would be, we count it for half, and theta equal one would say we count it for in full. And then you say, uh, you see, especially for the United States, uh, this makes a difference. For all the other countries, it's not that different, but for the United States, which polluted a lot between 1990 and 2008, it makes a lot of uh, difference uh, in this carbon budget. You say it a bit more clearly if you, if you go per capita, because then you see uh, what is left and you can see the big difference here. And maybe you can also, well, see what, what the absolute levels are if you see per capita per year in tons. We know in, in average countries in Europe, we, we spend about six or, or eight tons per capita. And then you see what in the long run as a budget is available up to 2050 on average. And uh, here again, you see for United States makes a big difference how we uh, incorporate this historic responsibilities. For the others, it's more or less stable what we have. And moreover, uh, it will, uh, well, slowly, slowly move into uh, what, uh, what is an egalitarian access to common space. But in the long run, of course, uh, everybody should be developed. And then we should also divide these resources equally. This, of course, is a design. Uh, it's just a proposal. There are many proposals out, but I think in the end, this will be a way to go because we have experienced many ways which were not successful and we have to do, uh, well, this international climate agreement, which is then applicable to everybody that we can have also in, in single countries, have a stable frame for our investment and uh, to know what our energy and carbon future would look like. So to conclude, I want to come back the first the longest part was on the microeconomic perspective on the building sector about the potential, which you probably know, but you probably wonder why it's not always achieved to, to, to get uh, the profits out of this. It was about reducing the risk uh, to depreciate and increasing the chances, but as I argued, depends a lot on the macroeconomic perspective. There, I think we have, uh, well, we have to inform better about what is the impact uh, of uh, energy on the economy in the long run and also in the short run. And that these things, uh, two things are not necessarily the same. And finally, as I have now uh, explained, it's a policy perspective. We have, of course, when we do our individual investments, when we look at the building sector, we have to think about the general frame, about the international climate uh, negotiations, about the, the climate policy, which will be adopted post-2015. It's uh, very uncertain. We don't know exactly what, what, what's coming out. But if we achieve to have a carbon budget, which is allocated with some reasonable uh, justification, then, of course, we will have increasing carbon prices. And then, of course, we will have a lot of support for individual uh, decisions uh, going in direction of sustainability. With this, I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>